Hi, hello, and welcome to everyone. We are here for another program of our series. Uh, this time, uh, we will talk uh, about the, the music in early childhood. Uh, I invite my guests to unmute their microphone for the one that have muted before, because uh, one of them is uh, no, unmute. This is mute. Uh, so uh, now it's muted. Uh, yes, the the one here. Yes, the there is a airy mass. Still, your microphone is muted, so you have to unmute the microphone. Um, in the meantime, I will uh, introduce. Yes, okay. So I will introduce uh, my guest for today. Uh, I start from the person that is at my right, and is Professor Nicholas Bannon. He is uh, from uh, UK and now is uh, living and teaching in Australia. He is a musicologist, uh, music pedagogue, and author of several books, uh, and including uh, first instruments that uh, I am going to show you immediately. That is this book here. First Instruments Teaching Music Through Harmony Signing, and is published by uh, Oxford University Press. And we will discuss about this book first, and we will start from here. Before, uh, let me introduce also the other two guests. Uh, we have Dr. Erimas Belishka, that is a musicologist and music pedagogue from Lithuania. Uh, nice to meet you and welcome to this uh, program. And then we have uh, um, a Professor Zinfira Polos, that is uh, uh, conductor of uh, an outstanding choir from Canada, the Hamilton Children's Choir. So I am very glad that all of you are here. Uh, for the one that uh, do not know me, I am Aurelio Porfiri, an Italian composer, conductor, and author. So, um, uh, without further ado, uh, I, I uh, before uh, uh, that we start, I, I just want to show to uh, people what are our media. If you want to join us, uh, please uh, like uh, the YouTube channels, Aurelio Porfiri, where there are all my compositions, uh, the composition that have the video, because I compose thousands, so there will uh, be no enough videos to make. But uh, then there is Aurelio Porfiri, then we have Ritorna Itaca, that is the channel where uh, we uh, uh, broadcast other kind of videos, and then we have this one, Chorus Master, then in Facebook, you can find uh, my groups is a Facebook Association of Choral Conductors, Music and Education Academy, Musicologia, Theologia, Liturgia and Musica Sacra. And also on Facebook, there is my fan page, the one that maybe you are following now, uh, fan page of Aurelio Porfiri with the, you can find me with that photo in uh, um, almost black and white. And then if you want to be updated about all our program, you can join my Telegram channel, Aurelio Borfiri, you can find me in Telegram, and you can uh, have information about our future program, uh, including the one we are going to do tomorrow, uh, let me show you, Vatican II, a pastoral council with two guests from UK and from United States, uh, with, talk about uh, Vatican II, so not a musical, uh, a musical uh, issue, but there will be another one on July 2 that is about music, social distancing, choral music, and the future of choral publishing, a debate on new challenges, and there will be myself, obviously, with Dr. Joseph Martin, and uh, we will have also Dr. Larry Nickel from uh, Canada, and still we have... Uh, our Zinfira Polos that will join also this program and we will talk about a slight different topic, but I think also very interesting in this time of uh, coronavirus uh, or about uh, uh, discussing what are the possibilities and the challenges that this very special time will uh, make us to face. So uh, Professor Bannon, we will start with you. And I would like you to say in one or two minutes, if it's possible, what is the main concept behind your book? Okay, well, uh, the book is called First Instruments, and 
you can see that there's some children on the front, and I'll say some more about that in a moment. Mm -hmm. Why is the book called First Instruments? Because the first instrument of our species, of our capacity for culture in every country in the world, is the voice with which we have been given by God or by evolution or through whatever explanation you are most comfortable with. I work with archaeologists and anthropologists who are interested in the theory that the voice had a very important part to play in the development of the human species. So in calling the book First Instruments, I'm relating the need for music education to be central to what it means to be human, to start with the first instrument, which is the one we're born with. And that's the second meaning. That is to say that we hear musical sounds and remember them from before we are born, in the last three months in the womb. And when we are born, doctors and nurses like to know that we're alive by hearing us make our first sounds. They may not be musical, but they are the root from which everything we can then do will over time grow. And in particular, the way that we learn to control our voices from very early childhood is intimately bound up in a response to the laws of physics. We, we learn to tune, we learn to recognize sounds through consonants and dissonance, which is deeply wired into our brains and has been for hundreds of thousands of years. <clears throat> so that's the title. Once upon a time, I was conducting a children's choir in England in a town called Reading, where I was working in the university. And I decided that a lot of our repertoire was going to develop from the children's own compositions and that I would maybe arrange or help to present them, but the ideas would be theirs. And I had one child who joined the choir and she was terribly shy. She had a little tiny voice, but she wrote a piece and the children hadn't learned notation so that the way we worked was that she had to teach her song to the rest of the choir. So after about, I guess, 15 minutes, they'd learned a verse of her song, a cappella, and they sang it back to her. A week later, I said, we must work on your song. Uh, could you sing it again so we can remember it? And she sang with complete confidence about 10 times louder than I'd ever heard her because she was carrying in her body and in her mind the feelings and associations of hearing the whole choir sing her song. And that, I think, is the parable about which all of my work has emerged. Uh, there's another book, a bigger one, called First Instruments, uh, sorry, that goes with First Instruments, called Every Child a Composer. And you'll see here the image of children making music in front of a dinosaur. That's the evolution in one go. So um, what the children are doing on the front of First Instruments is you see that they are performing a three-note chord using Kodai hand signs. That is part of a progression. We actually took 20 minutes to film that and decide on that particular frame because these children are following this conductor who is off the picture. And when in Reading, I wanted to take children's compositions and arrange them. I needed to teach them how to think in terms of harmony without depending on notation. So we developed a kind of para codai <laughs> system, which I've now taken from what seven and eight-year-olds can do through to something that we can still use for oral development and training in the second year of university. So there it is. First instruments, the basis for lifelong involvement, both as a singer and as a musical thinker. Okay, I, I think it's uh, uh, quite uh, interesting what you say because it makes me think, uh, and I, I think we discussed about this when we met in uh, uh, Australia many years ago, um, about the book uh, The Singing Neanderthal uh, by uh, Mitten that I'm sure you have used for your book. I know you have some relationship with him. So, uh, so and I think it's very interesting this uh, uh, 
this idea about the preeminence of voice uh now without going in uh, evolutionary terms or not but still really the voice is our first instrument and is the our most important and precious and i have the impression that sometimes especially when uh singing uh, for example we rely uh, too much on kind of amplification and things so, so trying to change the the, the the nature of the sound of the voice but never really focusing on the voice itself uh, on the potential because even the the person you mentioned or the the child that has a very tiny voice uh, uh, the fact that the voice was so tiny uh, is something important to to be uh, considered because uh, can have some kind of uh, psychological uh, importance so uh, i always uh, um, i always say that uh, music is never only about music itself you know music tell us so many things about what we are how we are in the world how we relate with the other so uh, I, I think it's quite interesting your approach and i i want to uh, ask uh, zinfira from her own experience uh, how, how you can comment on uh, this kind of uh, things oh thank you so much for sharing this story i think it's a precious story uh, because, uh, Nicholas, I was one of the children uh, who couldn't uh, pass uh, from the first time the test to be joining a professional choir school uh, back home in Kazakhstan. I'm from Soviet Union. And uh, my parents definitely knew that at home I'm so confident and I can sing melodies. I can even uh, f play them on a little piano I had at home, like toy piano. But when I end up getting to the actual audition for professional music school, I was, I remember my feelings. I was so scared. And the lady with a big opera, operatic voice sang for me example, what I have to repeat, like, and of course I was terrified and scared and I couldn't repeat what she asked me to do. Uh, I was struggling and uh, just going on a low pitches and do some funny sounds and I was not taking to the school. <laughs> and uh, it was a tremendous uh, disaster for me because I knew how I, I can do it, but I couldn't perform at that moment, given moment. And uh, it was a quite interesting discovery for me through all my life. Eventually, I get to the music school, not of that caliber what my parents wanted. It was a special uh, for uh, gifted children music school in Almaty in Kazakhstan. I never get to that school. But I end up in a simple music school and uh, I sang in a choir and at age about 10, I thought, I want to be her, like this conductor, like my conductor of my children's choir. I love it so much. And uh, my ear was okay. I finished the conservatory with a, a we call it a, a, a highest award diploma. I had all uh, A plus kind of level of, uh, and I opened choir school in Almaty, first choir school based on structure of, uh, Besna Children's Choir. I learned a lot from Panamaryov. It's very fantastic children's uh, program in Moscow. And uh, I opened first choir school in Kazakhstan and I take every child who enter the door. And I do the same in Canada. Uh, I conducted two big large choirs for children and I never turn away one child who wants to come and sing. I really believe if you can move, you can dance. If you can speak, you can sing. Yeah, I, I think it's uh, uh, what, what now uh, Zinfira bring uh, the, this topic of uh, uh, the necessity to involve all the child that want to sing. I think it's important. We will discuss a little more and I want uh, a comment later uh, from Professor Bannon about this. But now I want to hear what is the experience of Dr. Velishka uh, from Lithuania, uh, uh, a country that has a very big tradition of, also of uh, choral singing. And uh, I know composers from there, and I know uh, that it's a very relevant country for this. So uh, can you share with us something? Yes, Aurelia, you are absolutely right. We, we have uh, very great traditions in, in Baltic countries. And uh, I would like to say that uh, uh, me 
is also from uh, former Soviet Union uh, as uh, Zephira as well. Yeah. So uh, it, I'm uh, not a choir singer. Um, I, I began to learn music um, ten years old, and uh, and my master instrument is violin. And uh, I, I I was participating in one in one choir children choir festival. There, there are tradition of um, um, uh, choir festivals where, where I'm meeting um, several thousands of per performers, uh, mm. several thousands <laughs> singing, singing together. So. Uh, so my my ex, uh, my uh, uh, also uh, I remember my my first time uh, I, I participated in, in that festival. Mm. So, uh, so uh, but uh, vocal uh, vocal uh, singing is very important for me as a teacher in primary school. Mm. Uh, the, the first, uh, first, what we do, we we trying to sing together uh, some folk songs uh, in unison, in in, uh, in one voice, uh, mm. with some movements and uh, and so on. So, uh, uh, I, I think yeah. it's enough. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I just want to uh, involve again Professor Bannon uh, uh, and ask him to comment on this that also related to what uh, uh, also the other guest has said before. That is, when I was in Macau, uh, I, have, uh, I teach also in primary and secondary school. And uh, uh, you know, the Chinese child, they tend to be very, uh, very shy. You know they 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 are not like expressive like the Italians or or Americans. You know they are very uh, reserved, and so uh, I I learn that uh, when I uh, start to and also you know I teach in one school where the, there was also the difficulty of the language. So it means they don't really understand English and I don't understand well Chinese. So uh, we have to communicate to other people. So um, I learned that uh, to try to involve them in singing was not just making them to produce <laughs> some kind of sound or to participate in this kind of useless competitions, but it was really to um, relate on a human level with this kind of people asking them to create a bond with you. So it's something really much, much deeper than just having people singing. I think sometimes uh, a lot of choir directors in that part of the world really miss this. Uh, for them, uh, choir is just to have uh, an opportunity to compete. And, and I'm sorry, life can only be a competition. You know, we, we yeah, it's true that we have uh, evolutionary laws, uh, but uh, we are not uh, uh, we are not still uh, among the dinosaurs or things like this. So we should also try to use music as a way of knowledge, not not just a, a, a way to show that I'm better than you. Yeah, can, can you comment on this? Oh, I, I'd like to take the conversation in two directions. Coming back to Zinfira's point about uh, feeling too nervous to sing, perhaps, or, 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 or being, being evaluated, being chosen or not chosen at that young age. It's, I won't say unnecessary because maybe we do need to have opportunities for very gifted and talented children to do things. But to be not selected, I feel, is most unfortunate. And I have never allowed any child that I teach to continue to be treated either by themselves or by their parents as tone deaf. And I have always succeeded. And people around the world accuse me of not telling the truth because it is so easy for them to say, oh, well, it wasn't worth that person. They don't want to sing anyway. They're not very good at it. So why should I force them to? And by the way, this includes some people who are playing instruments. Their own instrumental teachers will say it doesn't matter if they can't sing because they they can put their fingers in the right places or whatever. So to begin with, I, um, 
I think we can have a conversation about some of the methods that we may use in different ways to ensure that every child can sing. Uh, in both of my books, I have entire chapters on this because actually some of the solutions have themselves come from evolution. We need to know the anatomy of the voice, not so that we can produce opera singers, although that can be a, a, a nice side effect, but so that we can ensure that everybody can, as it were, be given the kinds of uh, encouragement and modeling and um, if necessary explanation, whatever it may take, that allows them to make that breakthrough in controlling, uh, even if it's just one pitch and then moving from there. And all I can say is on so many occasions, I've been to conferences where one of the world experts on tone deafness has come up with all their statistics and say, here are the children who can't sing. And they'll play a tape and I think, give me five minutes with that child and I will turn them into a singer. So that was my first point. The, the second, uh, you, you look at the, uh, the, the wider issue uh, and I am really interested in, in, in perhaps taking that further, but actually, I think for the moment we'll move on to see what my colleagues feel about this concept of not taking not singing as sufficient. And what do we do? Um, I want to uh, involve uh, uh, Zinfira in uh, commenting about uh, uh, what uh, uh, Professor Bannon has said, and maybe we will discuss from that. Uh, it, it is uh, absolutely, uh, I agree, 150%, uh, because uh, whenever child come to your room to audition, we uh, in Hamilton Children's Choir, we even get uh, read of the word audition. Uh, we change that. This is intimidating for a young child to come to audition and prove yourself to be part of it. We just invite them to come and uh, sing with us. Even our flyer doesn't say the word audition. Uh, it is experience for every child, which absolutely important for whole being and developing your personality, social skills. Uh, as Aurelio said, it's not about just competing and making better sound than other child. It's community. I really believe when children singing in one room, same song, uh, it's still not a choir. It's bigger connection, it's deeper connection, and you have to build this safe place for child, for every child, that they feel and they can open their heart and soul and fully be involved in what we are doing in our room together. And yes, uh, I agree that uh, any child who come and can repeat two single pitches at the audition uh, when they try to sing, I say like, who brought you to the uh, today, your mom or dad, and they will say, mm, my parents both there waiting. And I said, don't tell them, we will play voice games. Do you know what voice games are? And child will say, no, I never played voice games. Let's try to play. I, it should be a playful uh, environment that child play till their tw age of 12. So really like um, even going with teenagers to the tour to Hong Kong last summer, uh, I noticed that uh, these beautiful teenager girls have little even makeup, but they still have this teddy bear in their bag going with them to the tour. So they're still children. And uh, in a few minutes, you can really develop uh, this connection and make any child to sing and explore that head voice, which they, most of them these days don't have because they listen pop music with their parents. They don't have environment to sing in the churches like so many um, uh, culturally, it's so difficult. I, I agree with Irmas uh, that when people singing at home, their parents singing everywhere music, this is one environment. But in, um, uh, I asked my parents in Hamilton Children's Choir, if we will sing just folk songs like in Lithuania, Latvia, Russia, like Ukraine, uh, which two songs you can sing right now all together? And parents will say, mm, oh, Canada, which is anthem. And second song, happy birthday. <laughs> there is no other cultural uh, deep uh, folk songs which everybody sing around the table suddenly, spontaneously. And that's really affect 
child understanding whereas my voice sits like speaking voice and singing voice and i will say like uh, let's do this like uh, if child singing twinkle twinkle a little star i will say can you do this sound like let's play I, I have a ball in at addition and i threw the ball and say whoa whoa and now you throw the ball to me let's play go to that corner of the room and we will play so and that's what i will do and if child have this easily access like any child on the playground produce these sounds and, and also, uh, uh, sorry, uh, and also I, I want to add something and then ask uh, uh, Dr. Velishka to comment on all of this. You know, I, maybe because I, I have my own experiences, but I remember it, indeed really during a competition, uh, there was a very famous choir, I don't mention what choir, but very famous from Asia. And they compete and usually they win because they, they were, at the time now i don't know because I, I i'm not more involved with this but uh, and i remember uh, once they lost the competition they they, it, they were like uh, adolescent or and i can see really these kids like empty you know i, I think uh, we should also teach the children that the music uh, is not only about winning is also uh, about uh, learning to lose because uh, losing is a part of life how many times we have disappointments we are frustrations we have uh, things we cannot explain or we cannot accept and so teaching uh, i also wrote a little book about this called writing on water uh, in my experience in asia because uh, what i really learned is that there there are so talented students so talented people really talented very nice girls uh, because i have a, a girls school and i really like them and i always tell them you are very talented don't let uh, don't think that everything is about competing it's about fighting with the other because you know in this way music become a tool of uh, social unrest i'm sorry to say if we only use music to make people warriors against each other uh i don't think that this is really the right thing to do so th this is uh, what what is my own experience uh, with asia and uh, uh, i know that that mentality is very difficult to change uh and also is not all asia like this i know very well but uh, i think this is also a theme that we we should a little uh discuss and uh, so dr velishka you want to comment on anything we said until now yes about uh about um, I, I want to tell uh, uh, one uh, uh, one episode from my uh, uh, from my uh, uh, teaching in school. It was one boy. Uh, we we are in in the classroom. We uh, uh, we are playing a lot of uh, a lot of uh, that diatonic flute. Uh, some simple melodies, and this boy always uh, was uh, uh, very enthusiastic to play. Uh, and and uh, he and his mother says to me, "We wanted to uh, uh, to learn in the music school some flute or some piano." Uh, and I said, uh, "Yes, uh, I I can prepare you for music school. We have special music schools in Lithuania." for children who wants to learn some instrument and uh, the one of tasks uh, was uh, to sing one uh, simple song and i realized that this boy cannot uh, sing pa 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 he he cannot sing fifth step after do uh, so so, uh, uh, the interval of quinta, fifth interval, uh, it, it was issue for, for, for him. So we began to, to sing with, with hand movement, yeah? Uh, do with uh, hands are like that, and so, do, so. With movement, it happens. Without movement, yes. nothing. So, so uh, we we worked uh, some uh, 
three, four or five individual uh, meetings uh, who met together and work with, 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 uh, with intervals. And uh, after after fifth meeting, he he already sunk uh, very perfectly. Song. Yeah, I think what, what you say is very interesting, and I want to introduce this topic uh, starting with Zinfir, and then uh, we will go uh, to uh, Professor Bannon. Um, and then this this topic of the uh, tone deaf or whatever you want to call uh, the people that have very big trouble. Uh, singing uh, the, the pitch and uh, so uh, I, I remember when I uh, started here in Rome where I am now uh, I have one um, one young boy that uh, joined the, the choir of the church where I was conducting and he really has a very big trouble to repeat a pitch you know I play a melody he cannot but I decided you know, at the time, maybe I was less uh, merciful than I am now. And so I I would have said, oh, no, please, you cannot sing here. But I decided to say, no, I want to try to see if I can have him to. And after weeks and weeks of uh, practicing with him alone, uh, he was able to reproduce the pictures. So uh, as my experience, and I, I think um, maybe you can saying or agree or disagree with me but really tone deaf people th there are not i mean th there are very very few cases because being tone deaf is related with a kind of brain disorder and this is uh, very very few people is really tone deaf so it means we call tone deaf more people than are actually tone deaf you know tone deaf is only a very very small percentage of people uh so it's only that we yeah we have people that need more work because they have uh, untrained ear or uh, whatever it is so i, I want to ask zimfira what she thinks about uh there's uh two uh things i want to bring uh up um when i listen to the child voice uh as nicole said it's instrument and um we develop this instrument through the life. Of course, I agree with Aurelio, there is maybe few people who need personal attention in this way. I'm look, I'm talking about health of the voice. Uh, there is a lot of um, uh, it, uh, games or like children exposed to at, uh, and nodules on the vocal cords can appear of age as four to six and then in 20s, this is two periods of life when people create this uh, can be happen. If child speak also very raspy and has some uh, health issues with the voice, I will send them to see the doctor. Just it is sometimes happened and I pay attention to this, especially if on the top of the pitches when they try to produce, the phonation is not happening like, <sighs> you can hear it right away. Especially like with the older choristers, I ask them to sing staccato on the top range of the voice and the phonation will not happen. Then they have to see the doctor. Um, but it's very rare, I will say, a uh, majority of the kids can match pitch. And sometimes it's take as a, as a pedagogue um, some extra work, as you said, like a few minutes after choir, I met, uh, met with a child individually just to help them to understand. But sometimes it's just airflow. If it's no energy and the airflow is not strong enough, like active enough, the, the pitch is not happening on the height. Uh, height. The pitch height is not happening. So it's sometimes just child being shy can produce that kind of energy. And I, I also like uh, these um, tips I will give, uh, not closing your ears, uh, you will hear your inner voice. Uh, if you do this, it's okay. Uh, but I like this very much. I don't even remember who showed me this, somewhere in Europe. But one ear, you make a shell and pull it forward, but this hand you bring and connect and you hold like this, you will hear very loud your voice and you will hear people around you as well. And this is really helps. Sometimes I just come to the child, stand on my knees and I do this uh, to help them to hear more what's happening. And uh, very often 
uh, children like uh, it's a confusion between speaking and singing also like the, some of them speaking on the pitch twinkle twinkle little star how i wonder what you are and they actually confused between speaking and singing and because it's so close for the young child um so but i really think every child can sing until they can do this woo, 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 siren sound they have no problem like it's just like time uh, to get understanding and also the third thing it's a feeling of vibration for children um i uh, was uh, really actively studying phonopedic method for voice development which derives from medicine for people who lost voice and this is um was led by uh, professor yemelyanov in from novosibirsk russia and uh, he is speaking and i like this moment i use it a lot uh, vibration or like bones vibration, the body vibration. Sometimes if you say to child, sing higher or lower, they don't have a clue what is this means, but they can feel, oh, oh, like feeling of vibration of the body helps most of the children to get through this experience. What is my chest voice and head voice in a way? And I use this a lot, even singing advanced a cappella music with my older singers, teenagers. Do, re, mi, fa, mi and fa will be always flat in uh, because it's a changing of uh, a, a, a voice approach, right? So, do, re, mi, fa, I will ask them to sing lighter in the head, kind of more approach, mixing the voice. Uh, then their tuning right away fixed, even in a cappella singing. So, but I really think uh, it's uh, studies. I will uh, like to read books of Nicholas. Uh, scientific discoveries and all this should be ingrained as a being just music teacher in primary school we have to know the instrument and we have to know the instrument well to help children yeah and uh, i want the uh, comment of uh, professor uh, bannon on this and then uh, i will uh, introduce another topic well i'd like to pick up on that lovely thing that you just did with uh yes that we call this the feedback loop, which is standard uh, understanding of how we learn language through imitation. We have to hear what we say in order to practice it so that we can uh, become members of the community that can talk to each other. Now, uh, very briefly, uh, some of the work that I've done uh, following up on the sorts of studies that people like uh, Christopher Stringer have done in the Natural History Museum in London on the fossil evidence of our species. Uh, or Aurelio mentioned the work of Stephen Mytham, who is an archaeologist. And in his office in Reading, he has the skulls in uh, reproduction of uh, Neanderthals and Australopithecus, Homo erectus, all these different things. Now, a, a, a long time ago, I think maybe more like 12, 15,000 years, we were a much smaller species and we had a bone right the way across our head here. Uh, and it anchored muscles here and here that came down to allow a, a smaller, less heavy animal to eat uh, bark and roots from trees. Now, millions of years of evolution, we do not need to eat in that way. We have things like pizza, we cook, we make things soft. Uh, we blamange. We don't have to be this uh, feral animal with big teeth, with a small brain. Now, you still have the muscle structure on the top of the head here that is trying to do that job. And it is released by fear and nervousness. And what it does is it pulls here, it switches off our hearing because these muscles here will interfere with that feedback loop. And something else happens. It pulls the tongue inside down onto the larynx so that we can take a deep breath and run. We call this the fight or flight reflex. So literally, I have found exercises to reverse those two things. And that is my principal way of exploring the voice of somebody who finds uh, matching pitch difficult. And I use a lot of exercises to free up the tongue just using the cheeks as resonators and shifting the tongue around even having the tongue outside the mouth because it pulls up off the larynx the larynx can descend and you then 
can begin to have the full respiratory control. Okay, so that's just my response to your feedback, Rip, because I loved it. Now, I wanted to say uh, two other things briefly. Uh, I don't know if I'm presenting where you might be going, Aurelia, but one of the things I want to say, I decided not to uh, first time around, but that is to say that um, I think Simfira mentioned this, and I know that uh, this is part of Eremis' teaching because I've seen him do this. I think a lot of us find that, uh, let's say, less experienced music teachers talk a lot about what they want people to do. Now, I've devised this form of gestural uh, involvement, which I can teach children to do for each other. So they don't depend on me being the teacher and them being the learner. It's, it's a kind of physical language, which opens up this idea of gesture being uh, in parallel with pitch and range and so on. And I have twice taught for an hour people who I cannot talk to. Once in Beijing, where I don't speak Mandarin, and once in Curitiba in uh, southern Brazil, where I don't speak Portuguese. And uh, Elmas has seen me do this. Uh, th there are ways of using gesture, a little bit like Charlie Chaplin, to have your turn, my turn, we'll sing together. You don't have to talk. So I actually wrote an article which was published in English and has been published in Portuguese as well about um, music teaching without words, simply not talking. Do it by the gesture and vocalization. The last tiny thing I want to say is this. We talked about the people in Canada who only know the national anthem, although they should know, uh, were you ever in Quebec, donkey riding? There must be great Canadian folk songs. I'm sure there are. <laughs> However, um, one of the things that justifies for me the reason we teach children, which we can tell children, is that they're going to be better parents. Learn to sing and other aspects of your life cycle will go better. You might find that you have a, an easier way of finding a partner, not for necessarily through singing, but you might find that singing with somebody has a social role at that critical point in late adolescence and early adult life. You might find that singing to your children is a really important part for men as well as women of bringing them into the world and uh, supporting their development. And there's a third life cycle. When people have Alzheimer's and dementia, they often can go on singing, but no longer talk. And the songs that they can remember and sing and join in are the ones they learned as children. So we have a responsibility to remind educational managers and politicians that singing isn't just about competitions that people win when they're young. It's a preparation for the entire lifespan. Yeah, and indeed, uh, I, I am very glad that you, you say this because it was exactly the topic I want to introduce. Uh, <laughs> I think uh, that sometimes um, there is a, a kind of philosophical mistake about uh, uh, children uh, singing. So for many, uh, like children, music has to be childish, you know, so they cannot sing things that are you know the too challenging because they are children so uh this is for example uh, this is just my own thing that i am very involved in church music you know and i have always to fight because they say oh no children they should see these very stupid silly songs and when uh, myself even when i was in macau i teach them to sing a gregorian chant or, or to sing things like this and they really can appreciate when you know how to teach them. And uh, I remember once uh, we were preparing to record the CD and I remember that I, I, I saw in the street two of my students uh, singing to each other in Latin, uh, one of my pieces, when they don't know anything about Latin before uh, having me as uh, their teacher. So uh, I think that this idea that Professor Bannon mentioned that I, I am strongly uh, in favor that uh, this kind of age children, uh, the, the child uh, age is not something in itself, but it's a preparation for the adult life. So uh, we need to prepare them even musically to the adult life because if we teach them to appreciate, uh, I don't know, Renaissance polyphony or whatever is good, uh, 
uh, good romantic music, whatever, they will always uh, have that in their soul for all their life. So this is really, uh, you can see the music teacher that make the difference. So I want uh, uh, Dr. Velishka, maybe if he can comment on this and then uh, Zinfira and then again, Professor Bani. Uh, yes, uh, the first thing that the uh, re repertoire uh, we um, uh, work in with, we teaching our children, it's very important uh, to be attractive for, for children uh, but there is no problem to to learn uh, not only children's songs or uh, but also adult songs. And uh, my comment is that uh, there is no problem for children to sing in another language. And in in the fourth fourth class, we are singing. I think in as many as 10 languages. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Yeah, I Italian, <laughs> Latvian, yeah, yeah. Uh, Latvian um, Spain, um, English, of course, uh, German. Uh, Latin, uh, probably. Uh, yeah, yes, uh, uh, th there is no problem. And uh, uh, when ch children um, uh, sing in, in foreign language, uh, when they sing some song, uh, le le learn to sing, uh, it's it's sim simplest uh, way to to get some basic knowledge about uh, this this language, some simple words. I agree. Yeah. Uh, Zinfira? Um, I uh, also like uh, think this is the most powerful experience what children uh, can have in their life because it's prepared them to be people who uh, can care, care about others, working in a team, uh, working with uh, other uh, people around you to create this beautiful music and it's always the goal. It's not about, I always tell to my singers, it's not about me, it's not about you. It's about music, and this is the goal. And I uh, hear when they finish this experience and they go to university, they always bring this to my attention and writing me letters. I have many, many letters. How this experience helped them. I love that they even they don't study music professionally. Some of them, they go and find at university choir. They want to sing, uh, and I think this is my goal: not to be. Uh, one of the leading choirs in the world, but create this atmosphere for kids that they will carry this love for music through their entire life. And this is so important. And these lifetime friends, they uh, meet with each other all the time. They have this connection. They care about people. Uh, and even in medical school in Newfoundland, um, I saw the article in the newsletter that uh, they, if they have two students for the same spot, uh, they will prefer a child who was studying music because their thinking, their way of vision and thinking, uh, it's different. It's so deeper influenced uh, from childhood studying music. And as Zoltan Kode said, it is far important who is elementary music teacher in a small town that uh, who is director of an opera house. Because if the opera house director is not good enough, he will be dismissed in a year, but a poor music teacher in a small town can kill off the love of music for 30 years from 30 classes of children. This is an enormous responsibility. I think it is huge honor and responsibility to work with young people. Yeah, and also, uh, I don't know if it happens also to you, but uh, for example, my students, when they uh, leave our choir because they have to go to university or they go to another school, they, as you say, they look for the choir there, but then they say, oh, uh, they say, oh, professor, but it's not the same thing. Because, uh, uh, of course, when you are in, in a certain group and you enjoy so much, it's not so easy to reproduce that experience everywhere. But uh, if they say it's not the same thing, it means they have something inside that we uh, live with them and that they know uh, how to recognize that the level of uh, involvement, of passion, of uh, excitement 
that they were finding in other school choir uh, is not the same. So I think this is also a big achievement. I mean, we give them the uh, possibility to recognize, uh, you know, a range of different qualities. And uh, um, uh, Professor Bannon, so I want also your comment on this. I think you already mentioned that, that uh, uh, singing is not just about uh, performing, but is to make people to be better human beings. So uh, this is what I also think. I mean, uh, ch uh, children music has not to be childish, uh, but they can sing whatever repertoire, even the great composers, and they can enjoy uh, like an adult or even more. What do you think? Well, um, I I'll say two things to start with. Firstly, uh, on the live comments, somebody's asked the question, how does this relate to Suzuki? And yeah. while Suzuki's original uh, work was very much related to the violin, the model that he used was that of good parenting. And he would insist that one of the parents would learn the instrument alongside the child, because this would be like learning a mother tongue. So the child would become able to play the violin because it was a natural, normal thing to do, not this separate, special thing. And also that the means by which that would happen would be uh, through imitation, the, the, the same way that language is learned in the first place. So I want to say a little bit, word, uh, a little bit more about the evolutionary side that for me does link to Suzuki, but uh, it is this that when we learn language as children, we don't actually learn formulae. We don't learn our mother tongue the way we learn uh, uh, a second language uh, in a later part of our lives. I'm not talking about people who are brought up bilingual, as I'm sure some of you were. Uh, but as a true English person, I had to learn different languages from the age of eight. So that was a question of very, very slowly learning formulae. That's not how you learn your first language as a young infant. What you do is you experiment. You often make sounds which aren't even good language, but they're exercising the instrument that will be used to imitate more precisely as you learn the tricks, you learn the feedback loop, sound, to the tongue, and so on. And it is fair to say that amongst the things that are most remarkable about very young children is they invent things that have never been said before. Within years of this difficult, unique process of acquiring language, they're saying things that have never been said in the history of the world just with a few little words and putting together extraordinary things. We have our own family traditions of the strange invented words that our children came up with. And this is creativity. What's creative about it isn't so much that we're rewarding people for inventing, although I think you can do that. It's a much more important principle. And it comes back to the story I told about the shy girl at the beginning of the talk. And that is, it's about ownership. It is about the entitlement of the individual to use this communicative medium to have and communicate their own personal ideas. Now, we accept that for language, and we even encourage it. We like children to tell stories. When they're learning notation, uh, writing, we ask them to write essays and stories and poems. Somehow, at some point in the last couple of hundred years of music, there was a danger of losing that. Music had to be the serious act of performing music by other people. We have a joke in England, it's usually dead Germans. And, um, sorry, sorry, dead German men, I should say. And so we very easily cut out 50% of our students, the girls, who think that composing is done by men or composing is done by dead people. And they're still alive so that they are discounted. So I think we have a, a number of very important things to do here. One is to get the singing happening. And we could actually reassure some of our teachers that they need to retrain to do that better. Because there are so many schools that I know of in different countries of the world where there isn't a music teacher. Just like the story about Kodai not finding that there was a good enough teacher that met the needs of the students. But more important than that as well is to have this understanding of what is happening in the child's head. It's not our job to just colonize. That way we have national anthems, guess what? We have political songs, we have football chants. We're telling people how to belong, but not how to invent. 
And as I say, uh, the key thing in First Instruments is the idea that at least part of the way we teach singing is to get the children to sing their invented songs to us. And I think this is, uh, 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 I want to take inspiration from uh, the last thing you are saying. And I want to introduce the topic of improvisation. Uh, because uh, uh, when we have the, the choral uh, singing, especially in certain environment, we uh, sometimes communicate to our students that they have to sing exactly in a certain way, because if they don't sing exactly as we want, uh, so it means they are wrong. And I, I strongly oppose this idea. Uh, because, uh, uh, first of all, I don't like the idea of the tyrant conductor, you know, that I really uh, oppose this idea. And I think sometimes uh, many conductors, they don't need uh, uh, to go to a better musical training, but they should go to psychologists because uh, uh, some conductors just uh, are, uh, you know, uh, how to say, I, they are bringing to their choir the psychological problems. So, so they, they, their willingness, you know, to show that they are the best, the more powerful, and everyone has to obey. So uh, this idea that uh, the students uh, uh, have to sing exactly, perfectly what the conductor think is not only wrong in a pedagogical uh, uh, sense, but it's also wrong historically because we know very well that a lot of music was performed much more freely than we are uh, used today. So uh, um, I want to start uh, um, uh, to ask your opinion about this topic, how you relate the freedom of, of improvisation where possible uh, and uh, your choral performance or your musical performance or whatever. And I start with Zinfira. Uh, improvisation is uh, quite a big part of uh, my program. Uh, so we have even um, a relaxation through improvisation uh, in, before the big concerts. Um, uh, all children uh, lay on the floor on their back and uh, some somebody starts singing, just giving a pitch and then they create. It can be performed at the concert. And now they are so fearless. But at the beginning, uh, it takes uh, courage for every child to be free to show their own idea to the group. And uh, I think it's a fantastic uh, tool uh, to have a, in a choir of any age, uh, even with little kids, uh, that it's not a wrong way. The word wrong, if this is wrong, uh, it's really make a blockage for a child. And uh, this is my experience, just uh, how it can be created. I was uh, studying uh, choral music in such a uh, very precise, rigid, do as I do, or it's like it's wrong, like it's really no space for improvisation. Uh, in When I immigrated to North America, it is, um, it's a very different approach. So in my school right now, like in my pedagogy, I try to bring these two different uh, schools together. And it is a lot of things I learn about improvisation uh, here in North America. And I'm very thankful because it creates such an atmosphere for uh, children, for singers. And it takes courage uh, to be independent musician. This is independent music skills which they can create. And uh, I also want to touch a little bit on uh, what Nicola said about ownership. Uh, this is a really important step when singers feel that they have a voice. They like I know I'm not dictating them from the podium. I always step down and I'm part of this creation and uh, exploring together and also creativity. So if you look uh, to some um, uh, performances of the Hamilton Children's Choir, I'm not even conducting. Most of the, like if I will do Bagarodice Rachmaninov, I will be on stage. But uh, if they are singing something upbeat from Malaysia, Malaysian song with a dance on the floor, I will not be standing at the front of them and directing them. They have to be independent musicians and they have to learn how to take responsibility and how to help each other. And improvisation, it's helping us a lot this way. Uh, 
and indeed I, I just want to uh, relate to what you say because uh, I, I wrote a, a book uh, that collects some of my essays on choral music and the title is Less is More because it's exactly this concept. So I also, when I was in, in Macau, I try to conduct less that was possible. And sometimes I just let them to do things and I sit. And of course I prepare them, but uh, I, I think really that sometimes uh, there are um, conductors that bring their kind of uh, egotic, uh, you know, uh, uh, so they have to be always at the center. You know, it's like, uh, uh, von Karajan, you know, he, a great conductor, but, uh, you know, all camera on him, you know, so that 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 that, that idea, I think uh, it's not really good uh, in general. I mean, maybe it was good for von Karajan because he, he conducted the Berliner Philharmonic, so, of course, uh, you have a great orchestra, but uh, I think encouraging people to take responsibility uh, the students, you know, I did always, I never think about the alto section as the alto section. I always think about individual altos. I always say, you are all responsible for your part. Don't rely on the one with the stronger voice or that look more confident. So uh, this is why I think improvisation, the idea of improvisation, that was also very alive, like in Renaissance music. I mean, they improvise a lot in 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 the in the piece actually we think that uh, you cannot change one note so uh, i think this idea as i say was also historically wrong so i, I want to hear uh, dr velishka what you think about this yes i think that uh, improvisation is particularly important part part of music education and uh, sadly that is uh, the weak point um, uh, of music education Especially in Lithuania, we 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 are teaching um, children how to perform, but not how to improvise. Yes, mm, uh, but uh, I think uh, it's very very important to uh, to allow children improvise as early as possible. And uh, I have a son of four years, and he. Uh, Actually, children before five years, uh, five years and younger, uh, uh, more improvises than perform uh, per performers uh, f familiar songs. Uh, as children younger, uh, uh, he he more improvises than than, than performs, uh, and uh, in in the classroom it, it's also very important not only to sing and to to teach and to learn uh, some songs or melodies but also allows children to improvise and uh, the very rich possibilities for improvisation uh, there are in lithuanian folk music uh, uh, because uh, there are a lot of imitations of bird bird songs imitations um, there are uh, many proverbs, uh, rhythmical proverbs, and you uh, can sing uh, not only not only um, speak this proverb, but also sing uh, in in your own uh, uh, tones. How do you like to, to to sing them? And and we practice in in, in primary school as as well. Yeah. With, with the okay. folk, yeah. yeah, thank you, thank you, uh, Professor Ban. Well, I'm really interested in this question of the languages that people have mentioned that they sing in the different cultures. I, I think this has developed very fast and to an extent in my lifetime, that's to say, the last 40 50 years. I, I think that there's always been some interest in borrowing and appropriating and making a nod to things. But I think that I, I've noticed this, that there's a, a kind of inter, internationalization of choral repertoire, which is extremely healthy. And what it does is I think it preserves the sense of wonder and excitement. Maybe from time to time, things are tricky. Some languages can be difficult for, uh, because they contain phonemes that we haven't learned ourselves in our mother tongue. But 
that's fun to encounter when you're young. So it doesn't surprise me at all to hear of Malaysian songs. Uh, here, we're, we're trying to learn that we must include more Australian Aboriginal music in our repertoire. And um, it's it's been happening. Now, what, one of the things that I think is really wonderful about that is the, the, the fact that the child is more flexible. They're not as set in their ways. They haven't been told that there's only one way of doing things. Even a little bit of naughtiness from time to time can have its part, a little bit of resistance. Because we talked about psychology just now. I think we're all probably quite good at finding the way back in. But to, to be confrontational and say, no, nope, we're doing this, is just not the right way. So I love the idea that we're talking about uh, both improvisation and expanding repertoire through introducing people to cultural products, which give them uh, a more global horizon. And that's another great benefit that singing in these institutions can, can bring to children. Um, I want to ask uh, always you one thing. Um, you, uh, um, if you can give an idea of uh, uh, to us about the impact of your ideas, what what you feel is the impact of the ideas you present in this book in the community, you know, musical community. You start with me. Uh, yeah, yeah, to you. Oh. Yes. Okay. Well, it's actually been rather difficult because both books came out towards the end of last year, mm -hmm. and. The, uh, the sort of book uh, tour was supposed to be happening. I should be in South uh, Africa at the moment. I should course. be going to be a week after. I was then going to meet uh, Animus in Finland uh, in August. Then I was going to go to Canada, yes. I was going to be in Toronto. And then go down to New York, to uh, Columbia Teachers College, to the Eastman School, to Juilliard and then across to UCLA and perhaps Seattle. I had a whole trip with all sorts of visits to lovely people with whom I was going to work either on the evolutionary ideas or on uh, the ideas in the book, the children's singing and the children's composing. None of it's happening. So at the moment, the sales, should we say, for that's just one angle I know, um, are, are, are not being um, helped by the fact that Two things have happened. One lockdown means nobody's going anywhere. So I'm so grateful to you, Aurelia, for actually having this solution of talking using electronic means. The second thing that uh, I think we, two of us have mentioned we're quite involved in are uh, solutions to the health problems that are associated with singing. The media got onto the story of the choir in Seattle and the choir in Amsterdam and the choir in uh, Germany as if now singing is something that nobody should do ever again because it's clearly very dangerous. This is going to drive a coach and horses through society. Children have got to sing. Old people have got to hear children sing and join in with them. So we must ask the medical profession to get that uh, vaccine happening soon, to look at other palliative and uh, uh, anti uh, antiviral uh, drugs, but also to look at the safe ways that even with current uh, positions in countries like America and the UK, where the virus is still killing thousands of people, we've yes. got to find a solution that does not allow uh, governments and educational managers to say nobody's allowed to sing. Yes. And uh, I want to uh, return to this topic, but first, uh, uh, before I want to uh, talk uh, also um, again a little about uh, the the thing of uh, singing uh, like music uh, from different culture or or with different languages and maybe uh Zinfrida can add something on this topic uh, uh it was a really interesting i must uh, mention about singing in different languages um i am uh, a foreigner in canada and i came from such a different background when i was a child we sang all the songs like ukrainian or lithuanian songs uh, uh latvian songs and it was our heritage 
of one country. And of course, uh, even uh, studying music literature uh, in uh, Soviet Union time, there was music literature about comp foreign composers, but then uh, all these Republic composers. And it was tremendous experience for me personally as a musician to learn all this. And uh, I keep doing that in Canadian choir. Like, for example, we sang a song. Um, we're singing about like 15, 20 languages, uh, including languages, unique languages like Basque. And I couldn't find uh, in Hamilton person who speak Basque. And we have to learn what the Basque, what the stresses of the words, how it sounds, because we sang in Talosa. And a uh, recent piece, which really was one of the unique pieces we sang, uh, from uh, Latvia, and when I start looking for the language and history of the language, it's a Latgalian language, and it is a, a tribe in Latvia, uh, and we studied everything with kids, geography, where this comes from, what the Baltic countries, what the music they're singing, what is Latgalian language, and I asked parents at the parent meeting, nobody have any idea, even at the concerts, I'm proudly asking, like, these kids know so much through this music. And we're working closely with Tracy Wong, uh, who is now in Canada. She's from Malaysia. And she. I, I think it's also so important to be authentic. I contacted um, Tracy and asked her to teach these songs. And I contacted a, lot, a Latvian composer as well, um, because I think it should be authentic. It's not just like mimicking, do some movements you see on YouTube once, and then you do it. It should be really organic. And she asked uh, people when we came to the concert, what do you know about Malaysia? And she asked my children too. They know nothing. And really like they just heard about plane crash. And she speak about that. And she said, no, we have children in Malaysia and they're singing songs. And this is Malaysian songs, what children sing in Malaysia. And we learn movements, choreography from her. And she even uh, explained to kids, like when you hold your middle finger, when you hold your hand in certain position, it, that belongs to Indonesia or Malaysia. And if it's finger here, it's one country. If it's finger here, it's different country. So, and I think it's tremendous um, experience to be connected with people from around the globe and learn about the culture and have this respect through music and respect to the composer uh, that what we are studying in, in a choir. We always contact composer, we bring people who speak original language and we do movements not for the sake of the choreography, but uh, it is truly connected to the culture of the country. Uh, I, I think I, I will uh, I will do something uh, I, even if I don't uh, mention to to you before. Uh, I can uh, can I show you a video of your Hamilton Schindler Choir? Uh, you your channel, so I, I will take from your channel, and you are singing a piece, a Gamelan. Uh, this piece by uh, Mary Schaeffer. Uh, that I think um, Mary Schaeffer is also someone important to to talk a little uh, be, between us because uh, uh, you remember maybe that uh, you put me in contact with him uh, many years ago and I think I talked with him at the phone once and then I, I study his book about um, soundscape uh, mm -hmm. and I think it's also a very interesting uh, a very interesting topic uh, so can I uh, sh show a few seconds of this video uh, sure, it's uh, voices imitate um, a gamelan instrument. <laughs> oh, okay, so I, I show a few seconds of the of uh, this video. Let me find it uh, uh, if I have it here. Yes, so it's here. I have to. So it's only I think three minutes uh, for us. Yeah, and you can see it's here. Let me put it like this. Thank <laughs> you. 
So uh, I think it's uh, uh, quite interesting also this uh, um, this way of uh, you know uh, having the the students uh, like to learn different cultures also uh, you know through the performance of uh, pieces that uh, reproduce instruments you know like in this uh, way like Indonesia or the the gamelan or uh, other kind of instruments. So uh, I want to. Uh, uh, introduce a, one last team that uh, also will lead us to our uh, meeting on July 2, that is about the situation that is produced by recent uh, events, uh, like the, the pandemics and the coronavirus, that change a lot for all of us in a certain way. Now, you, uh, before Professor Bannon was mentioning that he has to uh, renounced to his uh, book tour because, of course, I cannot travel. And also this, uh, we, we, we have not to forget that this also affect our kids in a very deep way. So uh, like my son or uh, uh, your son, if they are adolescent, they, they are now taught that they should be distant uh, uh, two meters from other people, that they have to uh, always wear the mask, they have to be afraid if someone cough near to them or to be too close to other people. So, of course, for choral activity, this is something uh, not to be, uh, you know, we, we cannot pretend this is not uh, existing. So, uh, I want to ask you uh, how you address this new situation that uh, we have all to face uh, for these uh, pandemics and the coronavirus. So I maybe start with Dr. Belishka. Uh, we moved to, to distant learning in Lithuania because um, visiting schools was banned. Uh, the children was, uh, was at home. So my uh, uh, what I I made I I made um, uh, slide Google slide uh, Google slides for children, and it was um, and wa it was a possibility for multiculturalism to show children um, uh, different possibilities uh, uh, how to learn in different languages uh, uh, many possibilities uh, many possibilities with african uh, swahili language uh, uh, with barbara uh, labamba uh, uh, this mexican song uh, uh, also, this this Parabaralla Bamba is mentioned in in Nicholas' book as as as, as mariachi song. Uh, so uh, uh, the feedback, uh, uh, the uh, worst thing uh, uh, in this situation was uh, we we cannot sing together because uh, there is no possibility to to think uh, with in with uh, in, in zoom meetings in zoom meetings yeah because it's, it's the lying so uh, i just prepared my uh, some 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 distant uh, fragments of 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 uh, of my my distant lectures uh, uh, I make short films how to play flute, how to sing uh, with uh, uh, Kodai, uh, Kodai science, science, uh, uh, and yeah, it was uh, was issue for for all of teachers and for for children as well. Yes, and indeed, uh, uh, we may, must also reflect that uh, this uh, emergency, this health emergency, also uh, force us to find other ways, you know, to reach people. Like, for example, myself, I find this way, and now, you know, I can connect people. Like, uh, we are in four different parts of the world, uh, you know, I'm in Italy, you are in Lithuania, she's in Canada, he's in Australia. But we are here all together talking very well and very, uh, you know, uh, sharing uh, as we are in the same room. 
So I, I think also technology is, is really helping a lot to develop a different way to connect. Uh, but of course, uh, and even for choir, you know, you, you saw all this uh, thousand of video of virtual choirs, uh, you know, uh, in the internet, but it's, uh, you know, uh, this also present other problems. Uh, and one of the problem is that, uh, you know, people don't learn to be with other people in presence because uh, of course uh, we are talking very um, uh, kindly to each other. And I'm sure if we are in the same room, we will still talk kindly to each other and we will not start to fight to, to uh, each other, even if sometimes this happen. But uh, is another thing, you know, so uh, this presents different problems. So uh, maybe uh, Professor Bannon, you want to say something and then Zinfira. Well, we, um, we went, uh, we, we locked down on about the 20th or so, 21st of March. And I had a lecture, uh, quite a big public lecture on the 22nd. And so I was the first person to use Zoom in, in our conservatorium. And it wasn't too bad, I made a few mistakes, because you have to learn about, you know, all the questions of stacking up examples and playing them in the right order, making sure that you get the settings correct. I was okay. So a few days later, we had our first rehearsal, and we had to use Zoom, and we realized within about 10 seconds that nothing was going to work. There was no chance of uh, going with an alternative. And in fact, all of my colleagues who've tried everything else have said that latency and different broadband speeds around the world, let alone in the same city, uh, just do not allow synchronicity. So yes, you can do things against click tracks. Uh, we found a way of rehearsing uh, using um, either MP3 files, which I created either out of Sibelius or other ways, or we would simply choose uh, either recordings of ourselves that we made before to keep repertoire alive and sing with them. But a lot of, I think, frustration came about because you don't feel, you don't have the sensation of blending and of being in time. Um, yes, you can sing with the product, however it's designed, but you don't get the feedback. And I feel terribly sorry for, for instance, boys uh, age 12, 13, who may go through a, a year or so of their lives in which their voices start to change and the interruption will be intense. I mean, I feel sorry for girls too, please. But uh, I think uh, I've just been writing about uh, uh, adult, uh, adolescent voice change in boys. And uh, many of my friends are cathedral organists in the UK and they're saying it's, it's, it's almost like a, a bereavement for boys who had to stop singing and will never sing trouble again, but they could, but there's nowhere to do it. So I, I would say the same about adult choirs of all kinds, opera choruses, opera singers. I have some friends who are grieving for the the, the, the sense that they have these roles in, I have one, one friend who sings Voltan, he was going to do it in Brisbane, it may be off, it, you know, and there is a fear. How long will this go on? So that when I do have to do it again, I'm ready. We went to the first performance a couple of days ago of the West Australian Ballet that's been allowed. They were very careful the way they separated from the audience. Um, and they're building up fitness because they, we think that they will be able to do their big uh, main stage production in September. We're very lucky in this state that uh, coronavirus for the moment has gone. So by the end of July, we hope under controlled conditions to be singing in chapel again and to uh, be able to rehearse carefully with separations both between singers and of the choir from anybody else in the building but you know with the huge cathedrals in england they're not allowed to sing at all so i do think that we need to talk to each other about the best possible way not merely of staying with zoom and uh, teams and these technologies, but what is the safe way of going back into a building in which we can sing together? 
Yeah, and as you know, uh, we, we have a program on July 2, uh, as I mentioned before, about this topic. Of course, uh, if you want also to join, you are invited that you can join us and discuss with all our, our panel will be uh, Jim Fira. Also, then we have uh, Joseph Martin from United States. And then we have another uh, from Canada, uh, the editor of uh, uh, what, what is the name? Uh, uh, Cyprus. Cyprian, uh, Choral Music, uh, that is a bigger publisher in Canada. So it will be uh, an interesting discussion about this topic. So, uh, Zinfira, you want to say something about this? Yeah, uh, it was a very uh, big year for our program. Uh, we have 250 singers uh, and six choirs, and it was our 45th anniversary. We prepared a lot of uh, concerts, and we were invited also and selected to perform at the e IFCM uh, World Symposium in New Zealand. Yeah. And oh. we have to be sharing concert with Stuttgart uh, Bernier Choir, and it was such a huge opportunity. Even you played Gamelan uh, right now, it doesn't deliver like half of the uh, sound and dynamics or anything. It's very difficult um, online, uh, and of course, it's shifting educational philosophy uh, for me. Like I see this uh, as a more uh, accent on sight singing theory. Uh, history of music, uh, cultural side. Uh, there is a lot of things we can still uh, teach children uh, through this. Uh, we tried to sing. We had some virtual choirs. And uh, one of the um, biggest projects we're also doing right now uh, with all children's choirs and youth choirs who are supposed to be singing in New Zealand but couldn't come, we will do together a project. And uh, we just did one with Philippines. There are six choirs and one uh, from Spain, one from, uh, um, there is a Hungarian choir, Philippines, Canada, and it's a Russia, Vesna Children's Choir. So we put this together. We try to connect children together around the world. There is a lot of opportunities, uh, as you said, Aurelio, like um, Chorus America uh, Symposium, which happened just a week ago. Uh, it was attended uh, and they said it was three times more people listening for workshops and lectures because yeah. it is such an affordable way for many of us uh, to be in a different part of the world. And uh, I think there, it will influence big time uh, this technology, our future. And I hope and I'm praying that we will get this time to sing together. We actually performed on the TV uh, for singers only on Monday. Uh, for Canada Day, uh, one singer from each part. They were two meters away. Each one has own microphone, but it's nothing the same. Like they want to come together. They want to be community. They want to share this um, emotion. What comes uh, to me, like there is a Chinese proverb, what comes from the mouth goes to the ear. What comes from the heart goes to the heart. To me, all this Zoom singing, maybe it's impressive, beautiful, but it doesn't touch me. It doesn't touch my soul. It's no connection. I don't experience this human connection. It's just a sound. And, and this is the problem, I think. Uh, uh, but uh, also, as we all mentioned, this uh, technology open uh, incredible opportunities, uh, you know, like the one we are doing. I mean, uh, we, we don't have to move from our home, uh, but we are sharing uh, and uh, experience and with the people that will see these videos, not only now, uh, live streaming that uh, uh, maybe are, are not so many, but many will see later but because the video will remain online and they will go and look. And I have the experience that some video, for example, there are few viewers during the live streaming, but then they have thousand a uh, few days later because, uh, you know, uh, YouTube keep proposing the video, uh, Facebook keep proposing the video. And so the people is curious. So I think uh, uh, this is something very interesting and important that we need the, really to think. And on July 2, we will focus exactly on how this also will affect publishing. Uh, so how, you know, uh, the, 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 the present situation affect uh, quite, uh, publishing, affect concerts. So I want to uh, remind you uh, about uh, the next uh, few programs. Tomorrow we have a program on uh, uh, Vatican II, a pastoral council. We have uh, Father Serafino Maria Lanzetta from UK, that is the author of uh, Vatican II, a pastoral council, and then Professor Eduardo J. Echevarria, 
Odo of Pope Francis, The Legacy of Vatican II, uh, is uh, also a very interesting program for those that are interested about Catholic issues. But then we have on, uh, on uh, uh, I think it's Thursday, uh, this one, uh, uh, Social Distancing, Choral Music and the Future of Choral Publishing. A debate on new challenges and with myself, uh, there will be Dr. Joseph Martin, um, and we have uh, Dr. Larry Nickel from Canada, and as from Canada is uh, Professor Zinfira Polos that is also with us uh, today. So um, I want to thank you all for the participation uh, to this, uh, I think, a very charming and lively discussion we have uh, among ourselves. I hope that in the future we can, uh, uh, of course, apart from Zinfira that will be present on Thursday, but uh, all of you can join for some other discussion, maybe on different topics, because uh, this is a good way to connect with each other and to connect with the world also, because uh, we, we uh, don't forget that in Facebook there are 2 billion people, most of the conductors are there, so everyone can, can uh, join and can, uh, uh, you know, use what we are telling and, uh, and uh, have a you know, uh, uh, like a confrontation with uh, our ideas. So I think this is important. Uh, maybe if you want, uh, you can uh, add uh, maybe 30 seconds, uh, something to conclude. Uh, so I will start with Dr. with Erimas Velishka. I, I want to thank you all for, uh, for being together. Grazie a tutti. Prego. Uh, uh, and um, and congratulate uh, my friend Nicholas for two books. I, I read only one of them and, and realized that uh, the second book was uh, published by Oxford University Press. I I, uh, I hope I, I will read and uh, a second book as well. Yeah, and I encourage everyone to read the book of Professor Banner because uh, they are very interesting book also to get new ideas and new approaches and perspectives about topics that maybe we give for granted already because we are used to doing certain ways. Uh, uh, but I think uh, these books are certainly very stimulating from a, an intellectual point of view. So. I really encourage everyone to get the book that I think are also available in ebook format. Uh, at least, is I think I saw in uh, in Amazon. Yes, there is also the the Kindle version, and I I, I don't know if, if probably there are also other version uh, uh, electronic version available. Uh, yes, it is one. Uh, there is not yet the audio book, but maybe will come with the uh, um, with the also this is another possibility for books so uh, professor bannon you want to uh, also conclude with 30 seconds well i'd just like to thank you uh Aurelio, for chairing this and inviting me and uh Edimus is an old friend we met in brazil oh eight years ago i think you yeah, um, we, we should have been meeting in Finland, but we are working on a project together, which we haven't talked about this evening, which is about the difference between um, men's and women's voices. Ah, from good. A, this, can be, this can be the topic for another uh, program. Okay, have, yeah, that's um, good. Uh, it's lovely to meet uh, Zinfira. Well, I, I know my geography is terrible, but uh, my wife and I were in... Uh, as. Azerbaijan in Baku uh, two years ago, uh, also with Edomus, and we heard Mugam. And I'm really interested to know whether you've sung any, uh, or whether Kazakhstan also has a form of Mugam. <laughs> this is uh, a, a great opportunity uh, for me and a huge honor to be part of this discussion. I definitely looking for a work of Aramis and Nicholas books. I will read them and um, thank you so much. I think this is one of the opportunities for us to be online, to meet each other from different parts of the world. And uh, it's wonderful that you shared your artistry and your knowledge. It's a wonderful colleagues. And thank you, Aurelia, for organizing this. No That's problem. Awesome. Right. No problem. And uh, so I want to thank you. Maybe you just, uh, you, you three, maybe just wait a few seconds after I conclude so we can uh, say goodbye uh, privately. And, um, and then I conclude now the program. And I hope uh, I will see uh, the audience uh, tomorrow 
for these other uh, broadcasts. So thank you again and see you soon. Thank you.